being late myself, but I'm chairing this morning. Um, this is the Faculty of in Homeless and Inclusion Health mental health network meeting. I've just seen that Jonathan has started recording. So if you're here, you're consenting to being recorded. And if you don't, then let me know. Um, we so first of all, thank you to Sophie for organising everything, as she always does very brilliantly. And thank you to Jonathan for advertising it all. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, I can see some familiar faces and some people I don't know. So if you're new, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, then please do. Um, so if one knows who we are, we've got two speakers this morning um, and we've got till 12, but I think we might finish a wee bit early. So we'll just see how it goes, how much conversation there is. Um, but let's get on with the first speaker, who is Nicola Gitchum, who is the Head of Healthcare Inequalities, Improvement and Personalisation for NHS England. Is that right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Good. Those funny titles at the moment. But great to see you all and really fantastic to be at one of your meetings, one of the faculty's meetings. Brilliant to see you. Um, my name's Nicola Gitchum, um, as Jenny said. Um, I work in the healthcare inequalities and improvement team at NHS England, um, but my substantive role is head of social prescribing. So we've been seeing some really interesting developments around social prescribing and supporting people in inclusion health groups over the last few years. So really fantastic to be with you. And I'm an occupational therapist by background. That's um, that's uh, my my background. Um, so Alex has asked me to come along today to talk about the um, inclusion health framework that we're developing at NHS England. First thing I want to say is pathways and and the resources that you've got on the faculty site have been fantastic help in getting us to um, think through what this needs to cover. So um, I thought I'd just explain what the framework is, why we're doing it, and we'd really, really welcome your support and thoughts. We've gone to lots and lots of different regional groups and we've gone to lots of different uh, stakeholder groups such as this, so it's brilliant to be um, be, be here today. So I have got some slides I can share. Um, so I'm going to have a go. It's always a bit nervous when you're in a new meeting. So give me a shout, see if they come through and um, and we'll get into it. So can you see that? Has it come through? Yeah. Super. OK. So over the last um, four or five months, we've been working really closely with OHID, with UKHSA um, and with stakeholders, regions, ICSs and people with lived experience to develop a national framework for NHS action on inclusion health. So the first thing I'd say is, of course, you know, supporting people in inclusion health groups requires um, everybody to work together. And it needs it's 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 one of those areas where integrated working cross sector partnerships and having people with lived experience at the heart of any design and delivery is essential. So we're not saying this is just down to the NHS, but at NHS England, we, I guess one of our superpowers is messaging to um, to uh, integrated care systems and to health leaders nationally, regionally and locally um, and supporting them to deliver um, uh, better services and, and really learn from them about what, what works and, and what we should be helping to spread and scale across the country. And so we were really keen to do something that actually provided um, much more focus for NHS leaders and much higher profile for NHS leaders on inclusion and health and, and we could have gone through a process of getting this <coughs> sign, signed off by lots and lots of different um, agencies but that always takes quite a lot of time and we felt that with the integrated care systems now in place we wanted to get something out that was out there in the field as soon as possible and was really going to help to deliver some practical action so so that's that's the reason why we've we've gone for this but so the framework will really spell out key things that um, we need to do to help improve the health care of people in inclusion health groups, but also how we need to work in partnership with partners in the integrated care system, sort of across the systems and with people with lived experience to develop a much more integrated, holistic, personalised 
support to people who in inclusion health groups. So um, I can't see any of your faces and I can't see any of your comments. So um, Alex, I'll look to you for a bit of a steer if I need to stop for a minute, but otherwise I'll just give a quick overview and then take questions and, and discuss it. So, so why are we doing this? Well, you, you'll be aware that at NHS England, we've been uh, there's a healthcare inequalities and improvement program, and one of the things that um, we do to support ICS is to, de to deliver on their four objectives of improving popular health population health, addressing health inequalities, um, using so, uh, uh, more efficient use of resources and our social and economic responsibilities of what we do as employers and um, our estate and various other things we can do as an anchor organisation um, and to help them to deliver the healthcare health inequalities duties is we have five key priorities that go out to the system through the operational planning guidance um, and what uh, priority four is around um, uh, improving uh, preventative pro approaches and um, priority five is around leadership um, and we've also developed something called Core 20 plus 5 approach, which really helps systems to use that approach to really take a focus on improving and addressing health inequalities. And in that Core 20 plus 5 approach, it's encouraging people to look at the core, the 20 percent of the most deprived um, uh, populations around the country but also to look at what they're called plus groups. And in those plus groups might be particular minority ethnic communities, could be people in inclusion health groups, and it could be other people, um, such as people with learning disabilities, for example. But what we've heard is that that's been really helpful in lots of ways, but it hasn't given this acute focus that's required around um, improving inclusion health, where what we know is not um, that people's the health inequalities faced by people in inclusion health groups is far greater than even people in deprived areas of the country. So we wanted to do something that really raises the awareness, helps leaders to think what to do. And we can't deliver our vision of improving quality health care um, for people served by the NHS in terms of um, excellent access, excellent experience, optimal outcomes, um, unless we actually have this um, greater focus on supporting people in inclusion health groups. So that's that's the case for change. Can't deliver on health inequalities unless we do more on supporting people in inclusion health groups. And so, as I said, working really closely in partnership. And the idea is it helps local leaders to understand what some of the best practice, key things that good systems do. Um, it helps contextualise this within NHS priorities. So what we've heard really clearly from integrated care systems is when they've got lots of other priorities they're being asked to do, focusing on a smaller group of people doesn't always help them tick some of the volume um, performance requirements. And we really want to set this within if you if you pay attention and you improve things for people in inclusion health groups, not only is that the right thing to do and it'll help deliver on your health inequalities agenda, um, but it can also make services more efficient and more effective. So we're really trying to set it within um, within improving access to primary care, within um, improving and recovery of urgent emergency care and within improving secondary care services, for example. Uh, people have asked us to sort of help them understand who's who in this world. Everybody needs to play a role, but what are the different partners and who can help? And we'll set out some key principles, um, which I'll come on to in a moment. And as I said, helps to accelerate preventative programme, helps to strengthen leadership and accountability. And what we're really trying to do and... Um, for anybody that's worked in a statutory organisation, um, sometimes the cogs don't work so fast on um, communications. But what we're trying to do is publish this by the end of September so that we can mention it in operational planning guidance that goes out and encourage ICSs to um, start to take further action in this area. So um, obviously, you know, we know some of the common things about for people um, in inclusion health groups of having experienced trauma or being in socially excluded groups, you know, but these are some of the particular groups of people we're looking at. And what we've been encouraged to do is to look at what the issues are that are common across groups. And that's why it's really helpful having your faculty 
that looks at homelessness, but also inclusion health. So really, really helpful. Um, so where are we so far? So we've done an extensive literature review and worked really closely with colleagues in OHID who've been developing a duty to cooperate on inclusion health um, for integrated care systems, which we hope will be published this summer. So we've been sort of working really closely with them. We've uh, worked with in partnership with key stakeholders. We've run a number of sessions with people um, who have lived experience from many of those groups that on the slide before. And that was incredibly helpful in terms of what are some of the key priorities here and why doesn't the system work and what would it what would it take um, to turn the dial on health inequalities? Um, we've worked with lots of national charities like Groundswell and Pathway and others. We've also worked really closely with Pathway and King's Fund on the work they've been doing with six integrated care systems um, around inclusion health and trying to sort of make sure the learning from that feeds into this work. Um, we've worked a lot with the regional teams for OHID, um, NHS England and UK HSA and some of the ICSs and clinicians. So lots of lots of work to engage in to listen to people about what the important things are. And from that, we've drawn five key principles, um, which I'll talk to in a moment. They won't be anything that you're not familiar with, because if you work in this area, they're the they're the key obvious things to do. But it gives us a way to message this and to share best practice in relation to it. Um, we're currently drafting the document and uh, then we're looking at um, implementation and communication and so anything the faculty can do to help here with or an advisors would be brilliant and as i said aiming to um, publish um, end of september and so these are the principles that have jumped out following the conversations with people with lived experience and stakeholders and the first thing is that we're asking people to commit to take action on inclusion health and the sorts of things that are in this sort of heading is that yes, it's everybody's responsibility. We want to see attention to health inequalities and inclusion health in key strategies for the um, integrated care systems and also regionally. Um, so not a sideline thing, actually embedded into the work that they're doing. Um, and we want there to be named leaders that actually are responsible for inclusion health as well as health in inequalities and that they actually help others in senior leadership positions have more immersive experiences where they actually spend time with people who have lived experience. Um, so really looking at sort of leadership and governance there for inclusion health and how systems bring together cross sector partnerships to um, tackle and drive um, work around this this area. And then the second thing is around understanding characteristics and needs of the local population. So really getting them to think through their population health management strategies. And what we know and you'll know is people are often missing from the data. So we want to really highlight here the key um, sources of information they should be using, but also that they take proactive action to fill in the gaps and actually look at some of the community insights and soft intelligence and strategic co-production with different communities in order to get and charities working in that area in order to um, really understand what the needs are locally um, to then inform number four, the commissioning of services. So the third one is um, developing the workforce for inclusion health. So we really want to set out that in order for um, for inclusion health to be everyone's business in the NHS, there's a basic level of understanding um, and knowledge that everybody needs working in the NHS, but particularly staff in frontline roles like GP receptionists, for example. Um, and so what's the, what's the basic training that needs to be done? Where do you get that development for specialist roles and expertise and sharing that? But also the other point we want to make here is how can the NHS use its role as an anchor organisation and start to think about how it supports the employment of people from inclusion health groups and what does good practice in that area look like so we'll be signposting to pathways work they've been doing with some of the trusts and also the sort of peer leader roles that um, we often see in good specialist um, outreach services 
The fourth one is really an opportunity to sort of highlight what's good practice in developing um, personalised, integrated, accessible services for people in inclusion health groups. And really, we're wanting to sort of showcase some good practice here in commissioning and planning of services and the sorts of services. And this gives us an opportunity here really to highlight the nice guidelines um, uh, on homelessness and really making sure that everybody's aware of those and, and, uh, and using those to help commission and design services and I guess we've got some tricky messages here of, of we really want people to commission those specialist services but also to look at sustainable commissioning models um, because that's one of the issues that's come out um, and then lastly we'll just be highlighting some of the good practice in how you measure the imp impact and improvement for inclusion health so those sorts of cross-sector outcome measures and participative research with people from inclusion health groups and just signposting people to where they can get help for this. So for each of the principles, what we'll do is we'll have a principle, then we'll have some uh, headlines of what good looks like in this area, then we'll have a case study and then we'll have um, uh, some practical top tips that people can do plus resources of where they can go to for further information and what I didn't mention was we've just we had a call for evidence recently and we've had over 80 case studies that came through um, and there was there was a spread across um, different in, working with different inclusion health groups a spread across different regions um, and some good examples of how people were um, de uh, developing and delivering good services for people in inclusion health groups so we'll use some of those for this but then we'll look at the NHS futures website for health inequalities and we've got a special page there on inclusion health where we can store some of the others and we'd be very happy to share and to look at those but there were some some great things that came through from from people in this field and then we'll finish the document with a few headlines on work that needs to happen next so we could have spent ages developing a strategy strategies often take quite a long time and we wanted to get something out that was practical that people can get started with but then we'll have a section about well what are some of the things that we need to do next so one example is we've heard from people that there needs to be more emphasis more more learning around some of the benefits realization of if we get this right for people in inclusion health groups, how it actually supports the NHS as well as improving quality of services and outcomes for people. Um, and so, uh, you, so, so looking at where we can do more around that, more around the data, and um, and various other areas that are coming through. So that's a real whistle stop tour on what we're trying to do. We've got a lot to get done really over the next month. It's quite ambitious. Um, but we, I would be really interested to learn what um, would what you would be interested in, and um, any top tips um, and anything you think we're missing. That would be fantastic. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing. Um, there, there you all are. It's good. It's always strange talking. Can't see people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's horrible yeah, but thank you how but, much um, communication is non-verbal yes no, it's, anyway great thank you do you think it's anybody out there has everyone left um thank you this is very exciting news it's exciting that it's so is it a sort of priority for nhs england do you think well so improving health inequalities is definitely um a, a priority and we can't do that without improving inclusion health so yes it, it's whilst it's been part of the core 20 plus five approach we want to give it much more profile excellent and, and will uh, it be affected if there's a change in government will it um i think um, a lot of yeah i think a lot of these issues jenny are sort of held cross 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 party um you'll probably know more about different conversations that you're having with different um government departments than than we might but yeah it's um Health inequalities is um, seems to be a common concern Everybody. across. Quite okay, right. um, I can only see a few people, but so so from us, I guess you, you said it would be helpful to know what you think we might be missing, and just remind us what people should be talking about. Yeah. So anything that any any thoughts people have, or anything that's um, anything you're pleased about, concerned about. Um, any top tips, that would be great. Okay. 
So if people want to put their hands up or speak in the chat, that would be great. Um, I I don't know if we submitted any case studies. Have you got? How did you find the people to ask them for? So we had a call for evidence, which the Southwest CSU helped support us, and we've worked really hard to get that communicated through all the different channels of the different regional groups that are there. Um, and different charities. So um, we have had some in from Pathway. Alex, okay. you'll be pleased to know. Okay. <laughs> and we'll certainly be coming back to you if we think there's any gaps. So I think, you know, there might be a few where we think, oh, we could do with a bit more, but yeah. And then just, I'm always a bit uh, un unclear about how the structures of things work. So this document comes from NHS Inc. So I talk it through for me as if I'm very stupid, which I am, but this comes from NHS England and it goes to the ICSs, IC, ICBs, ICSs? Yes. And then it becomes a, something that people have to do and is it kind of, how is that then measured? What happens next? So, so Jenny, you, you may have heard about um, a, a, something called the Hewitt Review and also new operating models. So certainly within the sort of the changes that are happening, what, um, what we're really going for is a leaner centre and more power to the integrated care systems. So at NHS England, we have to be there's it's quite restricted on what you can tell local areas to do, which is always quite right, because that's people say they have too much top down um, and what we can get out. But um, so what we're trying to do is an enabling set an enabling framework that we can then refer to in the planning guidance, which goes out to integrated care systems of what then boards of what they need to do um, to encourage them to have a stronger focus on inclusion health and use the framework to um, start to develop services. That's that's the idea. And at the moment, we didn't have another document on inclusion health to be able to get greater signposting with. And that's the that's the aim of this particular document. OK, so then it's kind of guidance for what good should look like and what people should be doing. Yeah. Rather yeah. than and saying so, what so, people must do. Yeah. So as part of your work on health inequalities, which they have got responsibilities to do and they have to report back on what they're doing around health inequalities, we're encouraging them to use. We would encourage them to use this framework. OK. But Jenny, sense. until until the until the paint's dry on a on anything that goes out to systems you never know exactly what gets in and what doesn't but this gives us our best yeah. chance okay well it's, it's great to have it out there um there's a couple of hand up alex yours went up first i think thanks jenny thanks nicola thank you for that really helpful um i just to come in on that really agree that having we, we hope that this really helps us as we're out and about talking to people to have this to point out and say it's, it's not just us saying this but look there's an interesting document it's going to be potentially really helpful, I think. Um, uh, just sorry, Nicola, we're in a rather noisy cafe around the corner. Well, I you thought you were. The Royal Colleges. Um, I was quite we're... excited when I saw you. I thought, I hope the coffee's good. Um, we have <laughs> asked them to turn down the music, but that's not what they do for their vibe here. Apparently. Anyway, um, um, but I was gonna, I, maybe you talked about it, but I was just wondering, one, one of the issues, and if John Connolly was here, I'm sure he's mentioned it, is our, our interest, particularly in the kind of, trauma and compound life course trauma and trauma informed care and all of that thinking I, I don't know whether you're are you referring to that in the document because we think that's hugely important kind of conceptually to get that no not just within inclusion health services but much more widely to at least to be thought about across the system is that something that you're is that yeah is that in and how, how so far do you think you can go on pushing that so in the workforce um, principle, we will definitely talk about the importance of staff having training around trauma informed care. I mean, when we're talking about the case for change, we'll sort of say why people, you know, might not turn up to appointments, things like, you know, so we'll cover about trauma informed practice. And then in the workforce principle, we want to pull it through to say this should be training that's available to everybody, particularly frontline staff, you know, so that they are aware and can support people. Um, and um, and really, Alex, one of the case studies that we got in was from the southeast region where they've um, had some of the training hubs in integrated care systems funding training on trauma informed care to improve 
um, understanding in the workforce and that's good practice you know it's sort of where where is how is that how is trauma-informed work part of workforce strategies for integrated care systems and regions that's you know that's why we want it in their mainstream work not just in as something that's nice to do for some specialist staff on on the side Okay. Thank you, that's great. And linked to that, is there any kind of thought about preventative measures? And Because the, the sort of group of inclusion and health is quite big, isn't yeah. it? So some things are kind of characteristics like rover people and other things, people who are homeless, that is something that would hopefully be pre preventable. Is there a, a link to that? Yes, yeah, so we'll cover the, the when we talk about the case change, Jenny, for the NHS, it's part of those more proactive, preventative approaches, isn't it? And that we can work much earlier with people um, in order to avoid people being in crisis, you know, and actually improve their life chances much earlier on. So we'll, we will connect it to that. OK, thank you. There was another hand up, which was Nick, I think. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, it's kind of following on really um, and focusing on the development of the workforce. So we, we got funded by, um, well, it was um, obviously HE and OHIT to set yeah. up a suite of programmes out of um, Southampton. So university certificated, so properly assessed and with a curriculum that reflects trauma-informed care and psychologically informed environments. Um, and also working at the individual, but also the systemic levels and also inclusive, both in terms of the people in, who are being trained and also the curriculum. So we want to end up with a sort of set of undergraduate pathways and postgraduate pathways. The, the, the barrier I think we're running into at the moment is how to enable uh, organisations to pay for those kind of things, because of course university certificate programmes tend to run at a, a bit of a premium. And I'm wondering if there are any particular um, structures or processes that we should be looking at to help organisations fund it. Yeah, I don't have the answer to that one, Nick, but I will take it back. That's that's really, um, yeah, I'll take that back. Are you talking, you must be linked up to the OHID network within the South East. Yeah, so Karen Simmons. Was Karen, the, so I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. Karen that's put this case study through, which I thought was really, really good. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. And, and and so I think it's helpful to know what the barriers are and and what else we can do. And I think we're certainly looking to the as because NHS England is going through a massive restructure, but there's okay. going to be this workforce training and education team of which HEE has gone into. So we're really hoping that's the sort of sort of where the so sort of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was like finish on the I was getting buzzed it? out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, are there any comments or, or thoughts from anybody else? Sorry, just before the drill comes back in, yeah. I have to mute myself again. Literally, there it's about two feet away from my right ear. Um, <laughs> is um, so strategically, I think that this this feels like where we need to go is moving away maybe from sort of. Uh, one day, two day workshop stuff, and not to denigrate that there's a place for it, but into longer strategic thinking around workforce development and particularly enabling skills acquisition. So yeah. the longer courses are very much about, you know, behaviour change and skills acquisition and understanding. But also, so there's that, but also it's enabling the workforce, enabling uh, peers, for example, and experts by experience. Now, this is where the universities struggle a bit because <laughs> okay. they're not set up, but we're getting somewhere with Southampton and uh, in, in terms of um, recognising experience and all sorts of experience, the, the, the funny bit is the next bit. The next bit. Yeah, everybody's a bit worried you're at the dentist, Nick. I think that's um, really funny. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> Funding training for peer leaders, and I think that's another key point to bring out. And um, I don't know if you saw the um, NHS workforce plan that's been published this week, um, but there was um, some there was some attention to non-clinical roles, and um, it, because I, I know because it was personalised care roles, and in that was social prescribing, health coaching, um, care coordination, which are great first entry level jobs but there was also um one around peer leaders for people in 
who have autism and peer leaders for people who have mental health. And there was a light bulb, Nick, that went on for me like, ah, right, OK, where's where is this for areas where we need to be really good from trauma informed care? Yeah. OK, thank you. I think there is something about developing the workforce, isn't it? Because I, I always remember at these meetings or at conferences, there's a sort of bunch of us who are very pro-inclusion health and you wonder how to um, spread that to, to other people. So I wondered if anyone had any thoughts about that. In our team, we've got GP trainees, which is a, a new thing. So we're a mental health team, CMHT. And in our Croydon sub-team, we've had uh, so CT1, so quite new GP trainees who who join the team two days a week. It's called a deprivation medicine module. Um, someone's coming in and we've just arranged for the same thing in our Kennington base um, through the GP deaneries and that actually has been really good for um, kind of increasing thoughts about inclusion health in, in GP trainees mm. who I wouldn't get any experience in it mm. otherwise and they kind of you can see them growing an appreciation of the complexities of the work as time goes on. I just wondered if anyone else has any ideas about how to get other people involved and more enthusiastic. Next, so next now communication by text, I think you don't have to. <laughs> I'll turn it off as soon as the drill starts again. It's, um, I think we'd love, what, the way we thought about it is it's having a certificate level at the postgraduate level, which is kind of easier. The certificate level is very much about the person and then the diploma level is very much about systems and helping people to configure systems which are inclusive and mindfully configure systems so, so that they, they include rather than exclude and looking at exclusive processes uh, mm. and, and we thought you know that might suit exactly GPs, nurses, anybody who is thinking about setting up systems and responsible for configuring them. Mm. And I think, Nick, there's a real thing with the integrated care systems, you know, with what they've been set up to do is how do we help them realise this for people at risk of health inequalities, but particularly people in inclusion health groups. So, you know, what should be happening at that system level within the ICS? What should be happening at the places? What would be happening in the neighbourhoods, like around general practice or whatever? And what's the workforce strategy that supports that change? And so I think that's, that's when I know at the Pathway Conference, Alex, it was interesting seeing some of the integrated pathways that were, and, and teams that were being developed in order to do this. And, uh, and so I think it speaks to a lot of what the ICSs have got to do. Great, thank so you. Yes, thank you, Alex. We're referencing that one. Brilliant. James. Yeah, I, I was at a planning meeting with uh, ICS yesterday, actually, um, thinking about sort of more strategic ways of adapting services. And I think a real challenge is just how short term the commissioning is for certain areas, whether it is addictions, whether it's supported housing and the, the, the sort of longer term investment and planning that's needed for our people who have multiple complex needs and aren't going to engage in sort of more mainstream services. And I think it's it's sometimes a risk for, uh, I suppose, voluntary organisations thinking about longer term planning. And I think maybe the, the needs to be greater partnership working over longer term processes to set up really, you know, supported placements which are adequate for the needs of the people we work with, because otherwise it can be a gamble for, yeah, vo voluntary sector organisations, you know, I suppose, putting enough funds into services to, to meet the needs of the people we work with, because, yeah, it, yeah it just needs much more comprehensive, highly skilled people working with it, adequate systems around people um, and, and I suppose adequate investment into buildings and so forth to make them suitable mm -hmm. for the people that we work with. So I, it, it, I think it's a lot of wider planning even beyond statutory services as Definitely. well that needs to be thought about. Definitely. And sustainability of the VCSE is, is, is key, isn't it? Because of, you know, the number of 
VCSE organisations that are supporting people in inclusion health groups. So I think, you know, the one thing I would say is I don't think we'll get it all right with this framework. You know, we'll we will we will make a decision on getting it out and being able to build on it as opposed to having something totally perfect, perfect and totally comprehensive. So I think that's what we'll be sort of weighing up. Um, but um, keen to get something out that starts the conversation, particularly Jenny, I mean, you've said about the, you know, we, we don't know whether we'll have new government next year or whatever. So let's get something out that starts the conversation and we can build on in future years. That's That's what we're really keen to do. Great. That helps. Well, thank you. Is there any other comments? That feels like a kind of nice place to wrap that up. Um, so the, the consultation is over. So what happens next, Nicola? We wait for it to be published in yeah. September, is it? Yeah, so we're, we are aiming for the end of September, Jenny. I would never, okay. I, re I remember once doing something called rapid recruitment at NHS England that lasted 18 months and I'm <laughs> never, ever, I've always been very careful about promises but that's what we're aiming for and um currently in in writing up but really fantastic to have this opportunity to talk to you today thank you for all your really helpful comments and um also thank you for all of the different case studies that have been coming through that's really fantastic brilliant and as as you say if you do need any more case studies if there's gaps then you know where to find us if there's great. things around mental health great okay thank you thanks so much for coming thank you Thanks, Nicola. Thank um, you. Bye. Bye. Okay. We've still got your. Ah, oh, right. Now I can see everyone again. Um, I'm going to switch the light on because I'm sitting in the dark. It's better. Um, and then should we just go ahead with the second speaker, Alex? I think you said you had to leave. Do you have any words of wisdom for us before you go? <laughs> um. Not, of course not, no, but just um, I think we, we do think that what Nicola presented is potentially quite helpful, so we should keep an eye on it and try and use it as best we can. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's positive. Um, OK, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It sounds good. So, um, yeah, it's good that it's been talked about rather than not uh, talked about always, isn't it? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and you put a link for uh, the conference call for papers in the chat, didn't you? So yeah. So just, just to remind colleagues that we're back thinking about next year's conference and looking for um, the theme we've chosen is from evidence to action. But again, as ever, it's an open call for papers on inclusion health. So if anyone's got something you're working on or that you think is relevant or useful to peers, please do submit your ideas. It doesn't have to be an academic paper. It can be Hmm. workshop material it can be a, a lived experience presentation of, of some poetry this year whatever whatever you think colleagues might be might learn from or might be inspired by great thank you and what was the date of the conference so we could put it in our diaries march actually it's next march it's no, on, on the link, if you click the link, 13, it will tell you. 14th, something like that. 12th, something around that Mid time. March, March. Usually, isn't yeah. it? OK, thank you. Well, let's let's move on to our second speaker today, who is Natasha. Natasha Chilman. You've got more names than that on the on the thing. So <laughs> yeah, Natasha is a PhD student, final year PhD student from King's. And you're going to tell us about or you can tell us about the title Researching Homelessness in a Household Survey. Yeah, pass this over to you. I'll pin you. Thank you so much, Jenny, and thank you everyone for having me today. Uh, today I'm going to speak about um, part of my uh, PhD research, so I'll just share my screen, my slides. I do this. Can you see that OK on full screen? Uh, yeah. Yes. No. No? I can see it. Can everyone else yeah. see it on full screen? I can just see it yeah. in a little yeah. corner. No, it's me then. Anyway, okay. I can see it, Is so it... carry on. OK, all right. Hopefully that's that's all right. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, researching homelessness in a household survey, some findings from the adult psychiatric morbidity surveys. So I wanted to start um, 
this talk by reflecting a bit about the um, evidence base in inclusion health and talk about why I chose to look at homelessness in a household survey. So if we look at the previous big systematic reviews in inclusion health, such as Aldridge and colleagues, Gutwinski and colleagues, and we look at the studies which are included in, in these reviews and the evidence base, um, we can see that previous research which investigates health inequalities and homelessness um, often recruit um, samples from specialist homelessness services, such as um, hostels, night shelters, um, outreach services, um, or sometimes specialist primary care services for people who experience homelessness. However, we know that not everyone who experiences homelessness has access to these specialist services or chooses to access these specialist services as well. So the people who access these services and are therefore included in um, a lot of these studies are often predominantly male, um, rough sleepers and focused in specific areas and locations. Um, but homelessness, um, as we all know, encompasses many different types of experiences, for example, sofa surfing and temporary accommodation. And incidentally, women often experience these forms of homelessness, and these women are often underrepresented in research. As studies are often based in one location, um, there are questions around how generalizable studies are to um, other locations or wider populations. And another consequence of recruiting from specialist services is that studies have traditionally focused on um, the health of currently homeless populations. Um, and of course, it is very important to be able to identify, map and better understand the health needs um, of currently homeless populations. And also some people do experience longer term homelessness. But for many people, homelessness is a temporary, although impactful experience in their lives. Um, but few studies have assessed the health of formerly previously homeless populations to, to look at whether um, we still see these health inequalities. And so this got me thinking um, at the beginning of my PhD, how can we study inclusion health slightly differently? Um, and household surveys are often used to um, assess the prevalence of conditions in the general population. And so I wondered if, if it would be possible to investigate health inequalities for people who've experienced homelessness um, in a household survey. And I was investigating different um, potential data sets for this, and I came across the um, Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Survey, or the APMS for short. Uh, so a bit of background about um, the APMS. The APMS is a survey which was conducted with adults living in owned or rented accommodation um, in England in 2007 and 2014. And these were with um, separate um, respondents and participants. So combining both uh, leads to a sample of almost 15,000 people. And um, the survey is nationally representative. Um, so they applied a robust multi-stage uh, stratified sampling design when conducting the survey. And the data set includes survey weights, which account for um, non-response um, to the survey and selection probabilities. As the name of the survey suggests, the survey focused on assessing psychiatric conditions in the general population. Um, and you uh, probably heard the statistic um, that one in four people will experience a mental health problem of some kind um, each year in England. It's a very commonly cited statistic. Um, and that estimate actually comes from this survey. That's the, the origin of that statistic. Um, but interestingly, the APMS is a really detailed and, and thorough survey, which includes lots of other measures of um, different health conditions um, and also asks about homelessness, um, essential for us. Um, but until now, this has not been um, explored um, in this data set. So in my PhD, I'm particularly interested in um, multimorbidity, um, particularly mental physical multimorbidity. So investigating the, the, the prevalence of um, multiple mental and physical health conditions, um, which is particularly important given the NICE guidelines um, published last year um, and also um, integrated care boards. Um, so the aim of my analysis is to use this data to um, assess for the prevalence of multimorbidity for people who've previously experienced homelessness compared to people who have um, never experienced homelessness. Hmm. And I wanted to share about how experts by experience, people with lived experience of homelessness were involved in this study. 
Um, so I've been in contact with two groups um, of experts by experience for this research, um, one at the charity uh, Rethink Mental Illness and the other um, at Pathway as well, which um, many people here are um, connected to. And um, I came to um, consult with these groups with my research question and design in mind, which is why I use the term involvement rather than co-production for transparency around that. But I wanted to be in touch from the early stages of the project so that these consultations could inform the development of the research question, determine the language to be used within the research, and also to reflect on the um, APMS together and provide different perspectives on how the data um, uh, was measured, for example. So when speaking to these groups, there was positive feedback around pursuing this research, um, particularly around the longer term impacts of homelessness and the um, focus on a previously homeless population. And when discussing the language um, we should be using to talk about this issue, um, we had a really inter interesting discussion um, during the early stages, I remember in the Rethink group, um, about the term complex needs, which is often used to describe multimorbidity in, um, in services and in, um, in the literature. But the experts by experience who I spoke to preferred the term multimorbidity as it was felt the term complex needs um, was not strength based and it was felt it could be used in practice as a barrier for service access. So, for example, experiences of being too complex for a service or not complex enough. Um, so we focused on sort of this uh, term multimorbidity. And we also reflected on the measures used in the APMS together and how the data was recorded, which I'll describe shortly. Um, so it's really helpful to discuss um, uh, the, the project with these groups in the early stages um, so that the analysis plan um, was um, enriched and grounded within um, people's lived experience. So I'm now going to describe uh, some of the measures um, and the variables in the APMS. Um, so prior experience of homelessness um, was ascertained uh, by the interviewer showing the participant um, a card and asking, um, could you tell me if you have ever experienced any of these problems or events at any time in your life? Uh, and we can see that number seven is um, being homeless. So this was left up to um, participants to uh, self-identify and does not um, uh, define the type of homelessness experienced. But they did ask a follow up question um, if someone indicated that they had experienced homelessness, they asked um, when they last experienced homelessness um, prior to the survey. And um, in my analysis, I focused on um, the prevalence of common mental disorders in terms of mental health, so such as depression, anxiety, um, OCD and phobias. Um, and the APMS assesses for the presence of um, common mental disorders using a scale called the Clinical Interview Schedule Revised Scale, um, or the CISR for short. And the CISR asks after symptoms of common mental disorders in the last month and week. Um, so this is a structured and validated scale um, which identifies common mental disorders with, with good levels of sensitivity in comparison to ICD-10 diagnoses. Um, this is, of course, not as thorough as a clinician interview and diagnosis, but importantly, um, using the scale means that we are able to identify um, potentially undiagnosed and untreated common mental disorders, which um, is why the scale is often used to assess for the um, prevalence of common mental disorders in the general population. And then physical health conditions were self-reported by participants in a similar way to the homelessness question. So participants were given a card with a list of 21 physical health conditions such as asthma, diabetes, um, and they self-reported which of these they had experienced in the last 12 months. And the survey also included questions on alcohol and substance use. Um, so the previous questions that I described are all asked face to face between the interviewer and the, and the uh, participant. But for this section of the interview, they gave participants a computerized tablet to complete this section privately um, to try and reduce social desirability bias. And then the answers were locked, um, given back to the um, interviewer and were linked back to their survey at a later point. Um, so at this, uh, on this tablet, participants completed the audit scale, which assesses for alcohol use, um, and also answered questions on substance dependency, 
um, which were based on the uh, DSM. So now some of the results. So out of the total sample of uh, almost 15,000 people, 599 people reported a previous experience of homelessness. Um, so this is a prevalence um, estimate of around 4%, um, which is comparable to other estimates um, in the UK. The majority of the formerly homeless group last experienced homelessness over six months ago, so a bit of time had passed um, until they did the survey, but after the age of 16, so that's in the blue here. Um, a smaller proportion in the green last experienced homelessness in childhood, um, and just 3% last experienced homelessness in the last six months before the survey. And just to describe um, the um, characteristics of the formerly homeless sample compared to the never homeless um, uh, group. Um, so in the left, we can see for age and um, the formerly homeless group is in the orange and um, that the formerly homeless group was slightly younger um, than the never homeless group. But when we look at the distribution um, by sex, we can see that men and women are fairly evenly distributed for both the formerly homeless group um, and the never homeless group, pretty much 50 50. Um, and this is really um, interesting, I thought, from, from the offset, because as I mentioned, um, a lot of previous research, unless it's um, specifically looking at, at women, uh, can, can be around 18, 90% male. But here in this private household sample with people with previous experience of homelessness, it was um, pretty much 50 50. Um, and as this is a mental health um, faculty meeting, I wanted to talk in a bit more detail about the um, findings around the prevalence of common mental disorders. So the, all the estimates I'm presenting are age and sex adjusted. Um, so this shows the prevalence um, for uh, common mental disorders in both groups. Um, and we can see a stark difference here with almost half of the formerly homeless group um, meeting criteria for a current common mental disorder. And because we're using a scale, the CISR, we can actually look at this in more detail by looking at the raw um, scores. So on the CISR, a score of 12 and above would indicate that the symptoms would warrant primary care recognition, um, equivalent of um, uh, diagnosis essentially for common mental disorder. Um, but a score of 18 and above indicates more severe or pervasive symptoms, which would be very likely to warrant intervention, such as medication or psychological therapy. And on the right, we can see that a high proportion of the formerly homeless group were actually experiencing um, the more severe um, symptoms of meeting this 18 plus um, group. And then um, my key outcome is uh, mental and physical multimorbidity. So this is looking at the prevalence of having a co-occurring common mental disorder and at least one self-reported physical health condition or problem. Um, and we can see that this is much higher within the formerly homeless group at about 37%. Um, but um, we can also look at this in more detail by looking at the condition counts. Um, so this is shown in this graph here. So at the bottom on the X axis, we have the number of conditions. So uh, people with no conditions, one health condition, um, two, um, et cetera. Um, and we can see that the formerly homeless group has a, a lower prevalence of no or one um, health condition. Um, but interestingly, um, there was a similar prevalence between the never homeless and the formerly homeless group for um, two conditions. Um, but we start to see differences in multimorbidity for three or more conditions. Um, so often when we talk about multimorbidity, we do often use the threshold of two or more conditions, as I've done on the left hand side. But looking at this in more detail um, for formerly homeless uh, populations, this is a higher number of conditions. And I also wanted to look at trimorbidity. So this is looking at the additional comorbidity of either um, substance dependency and or um, alcohol uh, use problem. Um, so this was uh, estimated to be 12.3% prevalence in the formerly homeless group. So this is four, almost four times higher um, than the never homeless group, which was 3.3%. So this analysis is ongoing as I am um, completing my PhD. Um, but in the meantime, I've gone back to the experts by experience groups um, to share these initial results and, and discuss them. And um, so they were particularly interested in the um, male-female split um, that I shared at the beginning. Um, and um, 
you know, said it would be interesting to look at um, if there are any differences in sort of the, the health of um, men compared to women. So this is something that I'm really interested in pursuing in my further um, analysis. Um, we talked about how this analysis is looking at the prevalence of current multimorbidity and common mental disorders in a previously homeless group, um, but that health conditions may have started before homelessness and associations between um, health and homelessness are likely to be bidirectional. Um, so we're talking about kind of the interpretations of, of this research. And um, generally, the feedback was that um, this is what they expected to see. They would expect to see higher rates of common mental disorders and mental physical multimorbidity um, in this group. But importantly, we haven't had the data before to show this in a previously homeless sample. Um, and it was felt that this um, data could be used to highlight the importance of support um, after homelessness. So once people are living in private housing and um, and emphasise the importance of things like continuity um, of care and follow-ups. So just to reflect on some of the strengths and limitations of um, researching homelessness um, in a household survey in this way. Um, so a key strength is that this uh, is a nationally representative data. So this is generalizable to the wider population, private household population in England. Um, and this does not have the same biases as in other types of research, as I mentioned, which rely on people being in touch with services. Um, and this study also includes a direct comparison group. So previous studies on multimorbidity and homelessness can often draw comparisons from other studies in the general population, but there are often caveats because multimorbidity can be defined and measured in many different ways. Um, but in this data, um, we're able to investigate the extent of this inequality um, with this uh, nationally representative uh, comparison group. The use of structured and validated scales to assess for um, health conditions allow us to, allows us to estimate the prevalence of common mental disorders, which may be undiagnosed or untreated. And this is particularly important for the formerly homeless group because we know that people who experience homelessness experience barriers to accessing care and diagnoses. Um, prior to um, my work on this PhD, I um, worked using um, electronic health records for analysis. And there often the, the limitation would be um, sort of undiagnosed conditions would not be picked up in the diagnosis fields. Um, so this is looking at, um, yeah, looking at conditions in a slightly different way. And lastly, although this is moving um, in the right direction for sure, um, quantitative studies using secondary data, data that's already been collected, rarely include experts by experience in the research process. And to my knowledge, this hasn't been done in a study of multimorbidity and homelessness before. Um, and consulting with the experts by experience was incredibly valuable um, for me and for the research process, um, so that the analysis and the interpretations of this analysis um, are relevant to lived experience. Some of the limitations, so the data is cross-sectional, um, so it's taken from one point in time, so we can't make inferences about causality between homelessness and multimorbidity. So it's looking at the prevalence within a formerly homeless group, um, but we also know that many things often happen um, in combination with homelessness, for example, financial hardship um, and other experiences as well. Um, but we're able to identify the sort of estimate prevalence within the formerly homeless group, but yeah, as I say, not look at those uh, causal pathways. Um, the data sets from 2007 and 2014. So the APMS team are actually currently conducting another survey at the moment, and this isn't out in time for this analysis, unfortunately. Um, but to my knowledge, they are asking the question about homelessness again, I think. Um, so um, yeah, definitely keep an eye out for this um, when this is available, hopefully in the next um, year or a couple of years. And the self, some of the uh, variables are self-report, um, so they are subject to some social desirability and recall bias, so they rely on participants to remember and self-identify. And the conditions that we include in our definition of multimorbidity are not exhaustive, so we're looking at that multimorbidity with common mental disorders um, and the physical health conditions and then additionally the trimorbidity. Um, but this does not include other conditions, for example, more severe mental illnesses like psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, so in the APMS, there are two phases of the survey. This analysis uses um, data from phase one, 
um, in phase um, two um, with a smaller follow up sample. They did assess the prevalence of um, psychosis. Um, however, we um, used phase one of the survey to maximise sample power, particularly in the formerly homeless group, which would be um, much smaller in the phase two. And so some takeaways uh, for reflection and um, uh, introduction for discussion, really. Um, so this data um, shows that multimorbidity and common mental disorders are highly prevalent in formerly homeless populations. And this um, illustrates the need to provide long term healthcare support, um, both during people's experience of homelessness, but importantly, afterwards when they are um, living in private house households. And um, this research looks at common mental disorders in a unique way um, using the CISR, um, which uh, to our knowledge is a novel finding um, and hasn't been looked at in a previously homeless sample. And having the data and statistics is really important, um, but there's a lot that we can learn from people's experiences of um, multimorbidity and homelessness. So I'm currently conducting a qualitative study um, with people with lived experience of homelessness and third sector staff members. Um, and to um, end uh, kind of with a question for you all related to impact, so I'm currently writing up um, and, and, and continuing this analysis um, to, to publish, um, and I'd be very pleased to, to share this with the group when it's hopefully out there. Um, I'm aware that a lot of people in the virtual room work in services and in clinical um, practice and commissioning. Um, and if any um, of these findings have piqued your interest in terms of how you would use these findings within your, your work, or if there is any further research that you'd be interested in using um, household survey data, then I'd be really interested to hear um, your ideas and also just welcome any, any feedback or um, questions about the project. And then those are my references. That's me. Uh, I will stop sharing so I can see everyone again. <laughs> right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Natasha. Oh, I'm echoing. Where's that? Where's that? Oh, should I turn my... Am I still echoing? No, that's better. <laughs> that was very unnerving. Um, do people want to raise their hand if they have questions or comments and or write questions in the chat? Um, it's very interesting, isn't it? So, but that's private households, isn't it? So I guess people who were still in hostels who might be the most unwell people wouldn't be included in it. But then and then homelessness wasn't it wasn't further defined at all. So we don't know anything about that. Is that yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it won't include people um, who are currently homeless um, and also people who are living in more institutional settings, such as supported mm. accommodation, um, prisons, um, other hospitals, hospital wards. Mm. Um, so, um, yes, it, it, it's just looking um, in a private household survey and um, so owned and rented. So I suppose that's interesting. The interesting thing about that is that even the people who recover enough to be in a private household still have that level of multimorbidity, which is very interesting, mm. I think. Yeah, the, I thought it was really striking to see that it was basically half of the formerly homeless group who are currently experiencing a common mental disorder. Um, that was much higher than I anticipated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, and yeah, in terms of the, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have that further information on the types of homelessness experienced. Um, but I was interested to see that male female split because we can we don't know for sure but we can make inferences it's maybe accessing different types of homelessness um just from that but um yeah yeah very interesting F phil has his hand up yeah hi um great great piece of work thanks for uh, sharing that with us very impressed um I'm, I'm one of the guilty men who focused on street homelessness and shelter homelessness, so didn't look at women, I'm afraid. And so I think great strength of this is, um, although you haven't, homelessness wasn't defined in the questionnaire, you're much more likely to be picking out people who would be classed as hidden homeless, not in uh, hostels or whatever, but sofa surfing or whatever in very unsatisfactory circumstances and now i'm guessing that's where why your your gender split is is much more much 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 more equal so you're actually capture, capturing um a uh, a homeless population that is usually neglected because it's not as dramatically obvious as people sleeping on the street or or, or sleeping in uh, in hostels and night shelters 
The um, the other thing is that I refereed a paper recently. I, mean, I can't say what it's called or which journal it's for, but it's from Scandinavia. And, and they, they looked at the bidirectionality that you commented on um, by looking at their national case register for mental illness and their national case register for homelessness and kind of seeing how mm -hmm. the two overlapped. And they echo this finding of bidirectionality, which I think is actually very helpful when you get the same findings from different countries. Because when I was working, we were bedeviled by papers saying homelessness is, and this was defined on three papers from San Francisco, you know, as if it applied to the whole world. So I think it's really, really helpful what you've done um, because this, 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 this um, shows there are, there are, there are, there do seem to be some things that are um, internationally shared and that we have in common. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you very much, Philip. And I'd love to read that paper when it's when it's out. The Scandinavian yeah, paper, yeah. those case registers. I hope they'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be really good to look into um, further. Um, and uh, just with your first point as well about the homelessness question and the male-female split, it's something we also discussed in the Experts by Experience group um, before I did the analysis and um, when we were looking at the measures. And I showed them the um, the card, um, you know, experience of being homeless because. I think there was some work by crisis that um, when people think of homelessness, they immediately think of rough sleeping. And so I was asking, you know, do you think people would respond to this with other forms of, of homelessness um, if they've experienced that? And the feedback um, generally was, yeah, I would interpret it within that way. So that's kind of another way as well, just sort of thinking about how that was um, measured and making inferences. Um, yeah, it would be good to campaign for further questions to be included in other um, or further additions of the household survey as well, because if we had that extra information, then that would be it's um, really, really valuable. It's really tricky because the more questions you have, the less likely they are. The less likely they yeah, are. So, that um, is true. Yeah, You've got to balance it as well, don't you? And it's yeah, it's quite a long survey as well. So yeah, anyway, thank you thanks, so thanks. much. Great. And I was thinking, Natasha, that it's not it's not just by directionality. Is it there can be common antecedents between? certainly mental health and homelessness, like trauma is the obvious one, and whether there's any way from telling, I, I can't remember what the other questions on that card were, but mm. whether there's sort of, you can see antecedents that might lead up to the development of both. Yeah, so there's other um, so there's other um, aspects on that, um, that card, um, I can show it again if that would help. Um, which I've also looked at. So I've I, I've also started to look at the um, other adverse experiences which are described in the APMS um, to uh, within the formerly homeless group compared to the never homeless group. Um, so this is the this is the card again. Um, uh, so, for example, and um, there's a few childhood experiences being expelled from school, running away from home, um, sexual abuse. Um, there are other questions in the APMS about living in institutions as a child as well. Um, so there, there are sort of various questions related to, um, you know, potential experiences of, of trauma um, within the APMS as well. And I think it would be really interesting actually to do further work in the APMS in regards to that, um, maybe as mm. a further study. Um, Yeah, it's very interesting. There was that worker, was it Harriet Watt who did that study about what, at what stage of life different things happened and showed that homelessness is quite a late event yeah, compared with a bunch of other Suzanne horrible things. Suzanne Fitzpatrick's work. Yeah, um, yeah, because the bidirectionality in that paper, um, from what I remember, um, found that um, mental health problems and substance use often um, happened before experiences of uh, earlier in people's um, mm -hmm. experiences um, compared to homelessness. Um, but then, as you said, Philip, there's there's need for a lot more work in that area. And then it's good to corroborate sort of both sides. I don't think it's a it's it's not going to be a neat either or either in terms of looking at that. They're just so. Um, yeah, because then also homelessness exacerbates um, health conditions as well. Um, Fill your hands up again. Yeah, just to say, just to support your, your decision, the decision of your um, experts by experience group to use the term multimorbidity. I think complexity is a very unhelpful idea. And 
um, and I'm working for the National Psychosis Unit at the moment, a lot of people refer to us and referred to as complex, but honestly, they're not. People mm. just have not identified the issues that need to be addressed. Um, and there are a few people who are genuinely complex. It's really difficult to sort things out, but an awful lot of people, they have two problems and people call it complex. Well, I, th I think that we're specialist services. You, you know, come on, guys, we should be able to address people who have more than one need, uh, particularly working in homeless services. And in a sense, that's a lesson for the whole of, of our health service, that if you're not, if you can't deal with multimorbidity, what are you doing with your life? You know, uh, this whole notion of a doctor or a nurse or a social worker being able to be focused on just one problem, I think is a, uh, is increasingly a ridiculous fiction. I can tell you as this is somebody who's getting older and who is multimorbid himself. <laughs> so there you go. It's a good point. Maybe we should have made that point to our first speaker this morning. Uh, comorbidity is maybe the norm. Yeah, yeah. When they're planning their NHS England things. Are there any comments from anybody else? No. Um, so you're you're in your final year, Natasha, and then so we published where you when when do you finish? So um, at the moment I'm finishing in December, so I'm in the final kind of six months um, of yeah analysis and and writing up. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, fingers crossed, it'd be great to come. I went to the Pathway Conference last year. I did a Petra Kutcher, one of those quick fire presentations oh, yes. every <laughs> 20, 20 seconds, which was intense pressure, but also really yeah. fun. <laughs> um, but I'd love to come back again next year as well to share. I mean, I'm really excited about the qualitative study to complement this. Um, so having yeah. the statistics, but also the experiences. Um, so that's what I'm focusing on. Yeah, at the moment is, uh, yeah, finishing the PhD. And I look forward to, um, yeah publishing the results, fingers crossed, going through that process. <laughs> Coming back to tell us about it. I know that we're all going to be um, referencing your PhD for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank so you. it's nice to meet you before we do that. Great. Oh, it's been really great to meet everyone. Thank you so much for your for your okay. feedback and your thoughts. And if anyone wants to get in contact with me as well, um, I don't know if uh, this is recorded, isn't it? My email is on the slides, but I'll also put my email in the chat. Okay, brilliant. Um, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Just wants to get in contact. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Well, that was really interesting. Um, if I spotlight you and shall I unspotlight you? Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, so that is Natasha was our second and final speaker for this morning. Yes, Sophie's clapping quite right. <laughs> um, so the other thing on the agenda is any updates or, or comments from any other service, anyone who's got anything that they would like to share with the group or would like help with from the group or anything, anyone, if anyone has anything to say, um, which is putting everyone on the spot a bit. I don't know. Sophie has her hand up. I'll just say something. So we Great. had been looking at um, putting together a meeting about the mental health transformation programme because that had been requested by someone. Um, but two or three of the different speakers that we were hoping to get are hopefully going to be available in October but we were just waiting for them to confirm um, and so we will set the date it will be either the first or second Tuesday in October because um, I think there's a real kind of feeling that that could be another place where we could sort of try and launch some of the more kind of inclusion health bits on a more local level I think as well so I'm hoping that I will be able to bring a bit more to that for the next meeting. And that's yeah. Um, my only other comment, I was just thinking about it because of the, the first speaker this morning and the comment about developing a workforce is that I was thinking that this is actually a really useful group and sometimes we have staff and vacancies which are hard to fill and I wonder if somehow the information doesn't get to the right people. So I, I guess I was just thinking if people have people who are keen who come to their teams and people who are interested in inclusion health um, and you know, we, we get people sometimes who, who seem very interested in the work and then their rotations take them elsewhere. And it would be good if they could be encouraged back into the field. So if I guess the obvious thing is to encourage people to join this group um, so that they can keep in touch and, and come back if they kind of come, have to leave. They've got an easy way of finding out about any vacancies available. I don't know if anyone else is having recruitment difficulties. 
<laughs> who else is there? OK, so um, well, if anyone has any final thoughts, please raise a hand or, or put a comment in the chat. Otherwise, we will finish early and we just need to think about the mm. date for the next meeting, I guess. Which is October, is it? Oh, Phil's got his hand up. Phil. I just think yeah, it'd be either the first or second Tuesday in October, depending on when the speakers are able to do. I thought I would do it that way around rather than booking That's the date. Then... I think the third week is half term. Yeah. So if we could avoid that week, that would be helpful. But I think you yes. know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Phil? Uh, yeah, the, the just the first speak from NHS England. I mean, am I correct in thinking that this is this piece of work is going to be effect effectively going to be a piece of guidance about what to do and how to do it. Right, OK. Um, speaking of, I'm not sure whether I'm a dotard or a veteran, but um, there have been numerous guidance works on guidance for good practice published over the years, none of which seem to have made very much difference. And um, I'm not saying that this is a waste of time, but I'm just thinking that we need to think about other ways of making an impact. And I'm somebody who looks back and think, really, I didn't make much of an impact on, 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 the, on, on the whole system. Um, and the discussion about multimorbidity made me think that we've actually, that homeless services have actually something unique to offer medicine and psychiatry. It's the way that all medicine and psychiatry ought to be practiced. Um, and in the long run, maybe we need to also think about making that point to the systems that we work in, because um, I'm proud of what I did, but I'm also distressed by the fact that I managed to have almost no effect on the system within I, within which I worked. And I don't know what the answer is, but um, it would be good to think about. Yeah, well, it's hard to know the counterfactual, though, Phil, isn't it? We don't know what would have happened without you. Quite oh, it was things would be so much worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, you did brilliant you for, work. Thank you for bolstering my spirits. <laughs> um, I mean, I agree. I mean, there's the obvious thing about that NHS England guidance, isn't it? Will it just be another of these things that exist and no one pays any attention to? But I suppose the, the good thing about those documents is you can yeah, you take can it to people and people. say, what yeah, about this absolutely. thing that you're meant to be doing, which does somehow yeah. work? I mean, yeah. I yeah. keep I've been to NHS England recently about the London Compact about something I didn't understand about admissions and got advice directly from them. And it's quite good to say this is what NHS England says. And then it does right. kind of make people listen a bit more than if you just yeah. say this is what I think. So I think it's yeah. better than it exists that it doesn't. But yes, it's yeah. true. I don't yeah. know how to. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing we're doing with the GP trainees is actually really helpful. Getting yeah. Yeah. the more people that you can have allied it's a very yeah. good way of working i think which i agree should be done everywhere in mental health yeah. but isn't necessarily I mean, and then I th again i think that one of the problems is the the homeless services are often very good and the rest of the mental health services may, through pressure not because they're not admirable people but i think they have less flexibility and less ability to do the things we're doing which is problematic. Yeah. I'm torn between saying that they're, they're all great people like ourselves, but on the other hand, that they've been working in a system for so long that it, it enshrines malpractice, that they yeah. cross to poor practice. Um, and there's also an issue about values. I mean, most of us had no training in exclusion health before we started it. So there is an issue about under, the, the underlying values that drive people that isn't really discussed very much or is, is, is paid lip service to. Um, I think it's quite interesting. Why, why, do people, why do people like us end up doing this? I have no idea. I, I ended up doing it because by mistake, really. Um, and I think that's a really, really interesting question. I mean, uh, yep, but yeah, I, think, and, yeah. I think that's what I mean, that once people get into it, they think this is brilliant and then yeah, they might get yeah. lost again because I think it is much well I find it much more interesting for, for all sorts of reasons but I think trying to keep those people involved and trying to keep up those values for everyone else is quite important yeah anyway yeah. risk of them um, one last point yeah the yes. issue is of exposure to this sort of work because in my years as a trainer I only had probably one person working with the star team who didn't get it Everybody else thought it was fantastic placement, but, and, and it did seem to have shifted their mindset yeah. a bit. 
so it's you know, if, if people can have students long in their teams that's really helpful but we just there aren't just aren't enough of us to 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 indoctrinate if you like brainwash train um enlighten um <laughs> enough of uh, our junior no. But um, one by one, the word will yeah. get out, and the more sometimes I do training at the GP deaneries things, and that's quite useful, I think, or yeah, common yeah. days. Yeah. So the more we can get the word out, the better, as always. Yeah. Okay. Well, if if everyone else has no final comments, we will close early and have a nice little half hour break. So thank thank you for coming, everybody. Please let your thank colleagues you. know about the meeting. So I think they are really useful and. Um, we hear about things that we wouldn't otherwise hear about, which is always very nice. Um, Sophie? And I was going to say, if there's anything else that you would like us to cover or any speakers, please do get in touch with me because I often end up struggling to find, you know, to kind of pull things together. So if there is anything in particular that would be of interest, let me know as well. Right. Or any okay. discussions or things as well. Lovely. And otherwise, everybody have a lovely summer. And Thank we'll you. meet on the other side in October <laughs> or sometimes and Thank you. relax. Bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Bye-bye.